Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's Nutshell Discussion. My name is Katie Adams and I am the Research and Demonstration Farm Manager here at the Savannah Institute. Before we dive in tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do. The Savannah Institute is a nonprofit organization based out of Wisconsin and Illinois, focused on agroforestry research and education. We truly believe that widespread agroforestry can help restore ecosystems, build resilience, and support strong economies of cooperation between farmers, researchers, and perennial industry builders. We do this through a variety of avenues. We host online field days, we offer print and online resources focused on key agroforestry practices, land access and lease structures, and the basis of establishing tree crops. And all of these are available for free on our website. You're also building a network of demonstration farms across central Illinois and southern Wisconsin and are excited this year to host our first agroforestry apprenticeship cohort. The Savannah Institute also hosts the perennial farm gathering each December. This year's event will be at the Cincinnati Mound Center near Dubuque, Iowa on December 6th and 7th. And if you haven't signed up, please do because we're nearing the end of registration. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central Fair, who without their generous support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these discussions for free. During the nutshell, if you're joining us from a computer, I want to invite all of you to share your questions and comments in the chat box on the platform. I will monitor them throughout the nutshell and make sure to address it during the Q&A session at the end. If you are joining us by phone, I'll give you instructions on how to ask a question after Dr. Case's presentation. So now on to the main event. We are very honored to welcome a presenter for the evening, Dr. Andrew Case. Andrew Case, PhD, is a scholar of history and environmental studies who explores the history of environmentalism, consumer culture, and changing ideas about ecology, science, health, and the environment in the 21st century. He is the author of The Organic Profit, Rodale and the Making of Marketplace Environmentalism, published by University of Washington um, in the year 2018. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Case to get things started. Hold on one moment while we switch screens. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks for joining me. I've never done one of these webinars before, so it's a little funny to not see who the folks are that I'm talking to. Uh, but I want to thank the Savannah Institute for the invitation, for Katie for bringing me on uh, this evening and for this chance to talk about my work a little bit. So I want to do a couple of things um, this evening, um, help you orient to, to my work and some of the arguments that I make in my book. <clears throat> and I want to introduce you to some of the core characters of the book as well as some of the core arguments that it makes. And finally, I want to suggest a few ways that this history is relevant to those of you working in agro agroforestry and its allied fields. Um, I'll try to talk for about 35 or 40 minutes, um, and then we'll, I'm really looking forward to an opportunity to talk and engage with folks working in your fields. So at its most basic, my work centers on the environmental and cultural history of the organic movement in the 20th century. And it uses the life of one of its earliest proponents as a lens. It follows what you might, what I, what you might call the unpredictable past of J.I. Rodale his son Robert Rodale and the company they led, the Rodale Press, to explore some of the curious paths by which the ideas and practices we now lump under the term organic have entered our lives, reshaped our cultural and natural landscapes, and ultimately shaped environmentalism over the last several decades. The primary character in this story is Jerome Irving or J.I. Rodale. Rodale was a writer, publisher of magazines devoted to organic food and natural health in the mid-20th century, and was largely responsible for importing, promoting, and popularizing what came to define organic agriculture and the organic food movement in the United States. Now, there are a lot of things about Rodale, which I'll explain in a bit, that make him an unlikely figure to add to the history of environmentalism. But what I want to first outline are some of the broader parts of the early story of organic food and agriculture in the U.S., to introduce you and sketch out a bit of the organic movement's unpredictable past, as I call it. The first unpredictable part of this story is that when we look at the origins of the organic movement in the U.S., we actually have to understand debates about soil that emerged in the U.S. and Europe 
in the years between the First and Second World Wars. While today we might think about things like pesticides, hormones, and genetic modification that have transformed a piece of food we are about to eat, in its original incarnation, organic referred quite simply to growing methods that relied on biological rather than chemical inputs to improve soil fertility. Whatever meanings we now heap onto this term organic, as it applies to a method of producing food, organic originally meant how much biological matter a patch of soil needed and the presumed superior nutritional values of foods grown in biologically fertilized soils. It is safe to say that many of the products that now carry the label organic and fill up the shelves of our stores and our pantries of our homes would have made little or no sense to people in the 1940s and 1950s. Organic referred only to soils, not to foods themselves, and certainly not to things like soaps and face creams and Gatorade and every other thing that we have that's now called organic in one way or another. So a second unpredictable part of this story has to do with who made up the early generation of organic enthusiasts in the United States and how their concerns about soils became concerns about the environment more broadly. We often think about the organic movement as something that grew out of a distinctly countercultural concerns about uh, and the sci uh, concerns of the late 1960s and early 1970s and the science of ecology. But in, the, in, the, in this case, that history looks a little bit different. And I would, I would imagine that many of you think about the history of organic. We tend to think about folks that look like this. This is a book published in 1969 in the Bay Area, Jeannie Darlington's Grow Your Own, an introduction to organic gardening. But we don't often think about people that look like this, uh, who were the folks who were the readers of organic gardening around the same time period, late 1960s and early 1970s. And in 1942, when J.I. Rodale started publishing his magazine, Organic Gardening, How to Grow Food Without Chemicals, the magazine took off not with farmers, but with a devoted set of gardeners. These organic gardeners challenged some of our expectations about what the history of the organic movement looks like in terms of both its values and, and, and its politics, as well as its relationship to commerce. These gardeners were citizens who paid very close attention to their backyards, and were concerned about the perceived hazards of pesticides well before the 1962 publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And too often the organic idea is treated as if it suddenly sprang up from the soil on a warm afternoon in Berkeley, California in the summer of 67, when in fact an entire generation of gardeners and natural food enthusiasts preceded the countercultural critique of farming that emerged in the late 60s and is arguably with us in some sense today. Excuse me. Now, you're forgiven if you've never heard <clears throat> of J.I. Rodale himself. The book has only been out for a year or so. But you're more than likely familiar with some of the other titles produced that grew out of his interest in natural health and that until recently were published by the company he created, the Rodale Press. Uh, you can see some of these titles here, The Good Old South Beach Diet, uh, the more modern incarnation of prevention, men's health, women's health. We could add Runner's World. Uh, we could have any number of wheat belly diet books, um, and the Rodale Company was sold uh, just last year to the Hearst Publishing Company. Many of these titles are still uh, in press, but the company, the Rodale Company, no longer exists. And this array of titles points to one of the most unpredictable, and I, and certainly one of the most uncomfortable parts of Rodale's history, which is what, while we can say he and his company made great contributions to transforming environmental values in the post-war United States, Rodale, unlike many environmental reformers, also made a fair bit of money in the process. As you'll see, it was Rodale's ability to build relationships with his readers and to incorporate those rela relationships into his publications that allowed his magazines and books to prosper as sites of organic activism as well as business. And this is where the title of the book and the fact that it is profit with an F rather than profit with a PH as well as the book's more theoretical claims about this thing I call marketplace environmentalism come into play. Indeed, one of the core arguments that the book makes is that Rodale publications offer us a place to interrogate the role of commercial culture in shaping the ideas and practices of a movement that was nominally about making things more natural. No doubt we often think that something like an apple that has been unsprayed with pesticides or, our, or the organic flax seeds I put in my cereal every day are somehow closer to nature. But what I hope you'll see in this talk, uh, in our discussion this evening, 
is that even for a movement devoted to taking food and people back to nature, there was certainly a, lot of, a, a whole lot of culture and a, certainly a whole lot of history going on. Okay, but let's get back to J.I. Rodale. As I mentioned, Rodale's life story alone makes him a pretty unexpected part of the organic movement's history. If you were going to search for a leader to change how Americans thought about food and health in the 20th century, you likely would not have chosen him. Rodale was born in 1898 as Jerome Irving Cohen into an immigrant Jewish family on New York's Lower East Side. His father ran a small grocery, and he grew up in a crowded tenement with seven siblings. He had no training in agriculture or medicine, and nothing more than a basic high school education in science. The only subject that Rodale had any training in was accounting, and in the 1920s, he and an older brother purchased a small electrical manufacturing firm, which they operated together in New York. Uh, there, so you can, if you look around on, online, you can certainly find some of these images uh, now and again of Rodale um, electronic, uh, electrical equipment. That part of the company has, has been gone since the 1960s, um, and, and you can occasionally find some of this, this stuff for sale on eBay as well. In 1930, Rodale relocated his family and his business from New York to eastern Pennsylvania, right on the edge of Pennsylvania Dutch country near Allentown in the town of Emmaus. Uh, now, when some authors have written about Rodale, this move from the city to the country has often foretold of a deep-seated desire of the city-born Rodale to go back to the land amidst the economic uncertainties of the 1930s. And such a move would seem to be in keeping with the organic philosophy he would become known for. Uh, many writers and publishers over the years have left big cities and gone back to the land and then wrote books to tell, tell their tale. Uh, and then there's parts of Rodale's story that match up with that, but others not so much. The move to Emmaus was far more pragmatic than it was romantic. Outside of the city, rents were cheaper, unions had less power, and operating costs for his, for his business were much lower. The move from the city to the country saved his, to the country saved his business during the Depression. Now, if Rodale had just wanted to be an electrical manufacturer, we'd likely never have heard of him, and I'd have nothing to do with, with any of my time. Uh, but despite his lack of education, Rodale always aspired to be something of a man of letters. And a few years after moving to Emmaus, he began pursuing an avocational interest in writing and publishing. Purchasing, purchasing some old printing equipment and using extra space in his factory, Rodale started producing small magazines devoted to topics like health, humor, and news of the weird. You can see this list of, of, of titles on the left from uh, a, a mid-1950s uh, list. And if you just look at some of the, the, the titles listed there, it's everything from organic gardening books to also um, word-at-a-time language books and ways, of stop, ways to stop smoking and, uh, and other things like that, and word finder, phrase finder, glossaries, things like that. And Rodale started producing these magazines um, at a time when Digest magazines were becoming extremely popular. Uh, he produced these magazines by taking excerpts from previously published articles and reproducing them in Digest format. Digest magazines had long been a part of American popular print culture, but in the 1930s, with the rise to prominence of Reader's Digest, the Digest genre was frequently imitated by publishers large and small. Additionally, for a novice publisher and writer like Rodale, reprinting stories was not only easy, it meant not paying writers, so it was relatively cheap. Now, if you ask me what J.I. Rodale was really, really good at, I'd say that in many ways he was a great clipper of text. He spent much of his time reading all manner of newspapers and periodicals and journals and books and quite literally clipping away at them and building his own elaborate system of clippings files on various topics. And he was also good at assembling things from those texts, at taking the small bits of ideas from piles of clippings and turning them into articles and magazines and eventually books. I mention this clipping skill and the popularity of Digest magazines because this is how Rodale, the accountant, novice publisher, stumbled into the debates about soil and health that were going on amongst some agricultural scientists in the years be between the First and Second World War. While reading and clipping away at a British magazine called Health for All in 1940, 
Rodale read the review of a new book called An Agricultural Testament by an English agricultural scientist named Sir Albert Howard. Won't really say much uh, about Howard's work or the social and political spectrum he came out of, but I will tell you that what Rodale took away from Howard was the idea that the application of chemical fertilizers to soils was producing foods that were nutritionally deficient and in turn poor human health. Artificial or chemical fertilizers are those that are made by human means rather than those produced through naturally occurring processes. Various types of manufactured fertilizers had come into use in the 19th century, but it would be the development in Germany prior to World War I of what is known as the Haber-Bosch process of synthesizing ammonia that would transform food production. Indeed, the ability to synthesize nitrogen is arguably one of the most important transformations of our relationship to the planet in the last century, something that I'm sure that many of you uh, have, have thought about before. Uh, but if you've never thought about synthesized nitrogen in the role of your life, now here is your opportunity. Now, what Howard and others were saying in the 1930s and 1940s was that synthetic fertilizers were effective at building up nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, but these new fertilizers neglected and in fact harmed the biological life that also made up soils. The soils, of course, I'm sure some of you have more expertise in this than I do, are made up of lots of different things. Particles of sand and silt and clay and rock and other mineral fragments, as water, air, and other gases, as well as a small but, of course, very important amount of biological or organic matter. And when Howard and others talked about natural farming in the 1940s, what they meant was food grown with naturally produced fertilizers, of building up the biological content of soils, rather than using chemical fertilizers to boost mineral content. The majority of Howard's research was conducted in colonial India, where he spent decades studying how to create biologically derived fertilizers by taking plant and animal wastes and compounding, composting them together. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, over the years, more than a few people have asked me, you know, wasn't all food organic before the creation of synthetic fertilizers? And the answer that I have to that question is one of those obnoxious things that academics sometimes say, which is yes and no. Finding a way to replenish soils is one of the oldest riddles that agricultural societies have faced. As plants grow, they invariably draw down nutrient content, and farming cultures over the centuries have developed all sorts of means for improving soils that involve everything from dead fish to fossilized bird droppings to picking up and moving to another place. So yes, lots of fields over the last 10,000 years were fertilized with organic matter. But I'd argue that only once artificial or synthetic fertilizers come into existence in the early 20th century will the concept of something like organically grown make any sense. So yes, farmers have used biological materials to fertilize soils for centuries, but only once there was a chemical alternative could something be labeled as organic. And what Rodale did after learning about Howard in 1940 was to apply the term organic to fertilization practices that relied on composts or biological inputs rather than on chemical inputs. Howard had also claimed that crops produced without chemical fertilizers produced healthier animals and in turn healthier people. But with few scientific studies to back up this key claim, those interested in, in, in organic, organic reformers, we're really at a loss for evidence to support the idea that how soils were fertilized had a direct connection with human health. And it was really this idea that J.I. Rodale latched onto, that compost could compete with chemical fertilizers and produce healthier food. And to prove that claim, he bought a farm to produce his own evidence. Howard's idea, Rodale said, quote, hit me like a ton of bricks. Quote, the impact on me was terrific. It changed my whole life. I decided we must get a farm at once and raise as much of our family's food by the organic method as possible, end quote. It was this enthusiasm for the health possibilities of organically grown food which led Rodale to found Organic Farming and Gardening magazine in May of 1942 and begin writing books about the merits of organic food. Now, as I said, Rodale literally had no training in farming, and aside from keeping a few plants had little experience even in a garden. When he set out to restore a worn out Pennsylvania farm 
and grow food without chemical fertilizers, he was not actually doing the work of farming himself, but instead relying on hired labor. What he discovered early on is that even though chemical fertilizers could be costly, they were often cheaper than paying for farm labor. Howard's composting experiments had been conducted in a plantation economy of colonial India, a place with an abundance of cheap labor. That was simply not the case in the United States. Indeed, one of the appeals of chemical fertilizers for farmers was that these technologies replaced the time and labor-intensive processes of manuring and crop rotation. Labor scarcity was a perennial and arguably defining problem of American agriculture, and one that was even more acute during the wartime labor shortages of the 1940s. And it's in this context that Rodale begins promoting an idea that requires more work. At a time when farmers were looking to reduce labor inputs, he's asking them to increase the amount of work that needs to be done. And this remains, uh, by, in many ways, one of the central problems of organic agriculture is that it generally requires the application of more human labor to do work that could otherwise be done with chemicals. Like machines, chemicals rarely call in sick, and they don't do pesky things like ask for better wages or better health care. And one of the reasons that we don't hear much about this early history of the organic movement is because it largely failed. Asking farmers to create their own fertilizers out of agricultural wastes simply ran counter to the basic trend of the agricultural economy of the 20, in, the, in the 20th century. In 1942, Rodale sent out 10,000 copies of his magazine in its first incarnation and got 12 subscriptions in return. In addition, nearly every attempt to interest state agricultural experiment stations, land-grant colleges, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to research the use of organic fertilizers went nowhere for several decades. However, where Rodale did find an audience for his claims was about using organic fertilizers would be not on the farm, but instead in the garden. And you'll notice here that uh, this earliest incarnation is, is actually, is the magazine is Organic Farming and Gardening, um, and then just a, a, a year later it is just, it is just Organic Gardening. Farming comes back in about a decade later. <clears throat> At the time that Rodale began writing about improving soils with organic matter, gardening in the United States was experiencing one of its periodic moments of revival. Gardening was a point of civic pride amidst the victory garden campaigns of World War II, and after a few issues, Rodell dropped farming from the title of his magazine to focus solely on convincing gardeners to use what he now called homemade fertilizers. As garden writer Eleanor Perrinier recalled, under the guidance of Rodell's organic gardening, in the 1940s, gardeners like her, quote, threw out our poisons we had been using in our victory gardens sent for earthworms, praying mantises, and ladybugs to kill our aphids, all to a chorus of laughter and some irritation from our assistants. But we knew in our heart that Mr. Rodale was right." End quote. With the help of these gardeners, Rodale's magazine was reaching 60,000 readers by the, end of the early, uh, by, by the early 1950s, a number that would steadily climb in decades to come. Of course, relying on compost was a different story for gardeners than farmers. Not only was their labor their own, most did not depend on their gardens as their sole source of income or food. Furthermore, the labor required at the scale of the garden hardly compared to the labor at the scale of the farm, a lesson that more than a few enthusiasts of urban and local and sustainable agriculture learn the hard ways these days when they try to scale up backyard projects. And I just want to flag uh, for this group in the, inside of this list that uh, there is a, a brief article here on compost and the orchard. I'll mention a little bit more about tree growing uh, towards the end of the talk. Organic gardeners distinguish themselves by also rejecting the use of the new class of pesticides that hit the market in the years after 1945. In addition to the chemical compounds constituting artificial fertilizers, a whole new array of synthetic compounds made their way into the world of farming, gardening, and daily life after 1945. The introduction of a new class of pesticides after World War II, the, or, the chlorinated organic hydrocarbons, made organic gardeners even more concerned. The majority of these new compounds, substances like aldrin, dieldrin, Endrin, and Toxaphene 
were used primarily only in agricultural settings, as they were far too acutely toxic for use in the home garden. Nonetheless, these new substances, which were remarkably effective precisely because they were designed not to break down and wash away, soon became a source of concern for organic gardeners in all the food products they consumed, not just those that they grew at home. Now, as I said, J.I. Rodale himself is a central part of the story I tell in the book, but the book also centers on what these organic gardeners did with his magazine. It can be easy to forget that people don't just subscribe to magazines. They often make them a part of their lives, and that devoted readers develop something of a back and forth relationship with those who produce a magazine. And if you've ever noted, known a devoted gardener or you are one yourself, you know how passionate they can be about their own system for producing the best tomatoes or the best roses or the best whatever, and how eager they are also, also often are to tell someone about it. And in the pages of Rodale's Organic Gardening, we can see gardeners and natural health consumers becoming interested in more than what is happening in their own tomato patch and sharing with one another their experiences with the broader changes in the material ecology of daily life in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, I don't think it's too harsh to say that organic gardeners and natural food folks were sort of outsiders for a long time, all but ignored, if not outright derided, by agricultural scientists. Uh, organic enthusiasts were mocked as fattists and health nuts and little old ladies in tennis shoes. And there's much to be said about how Rodale Publications and the marketplace more generally fostered a type of popular science that could border on pseudoscience that made organic folks pretty hard to take seriously at times. I won't say much about that now, but I'd be happy to talk more about it when we have a chance for Q&A. The point here is that even without the backing of scientists and experts and a, a research infrastructure of, of modern, modern universities, and, and working outside of the, the, the circle of, of land-grant colleges and the industry, organic gardeners use the pages of Rodale's magazine to create their own evidence for the virtues of the organic method. And one of the defining features of all the Rodale Company's magazines was the fact that the pages were remarkably open to readers and their interests. Organic Gardening published Rodale's own writing and articles clipped from scientific and medical sources, but also the reprinted stories and ideas that readers sent him. Always a collector of clippings and evidence, Organic Gardening actively encouraged readers to write in to share the tips and tricks they used in making compost and to describe the results of their gardens. To offer just a few examples that came from the Reader's Correspondence Department or the Interesting Letters Department, in February 1946, the magazine ran the letter of one Bingham Small, who claimed, quote, even in the matter of our daily, of our own plot of ground which we garden, science would wish to drown us with poison sprays and chemicals. Is it any wonder that we jump at the first-hand experience which organic offers us? Here, indeed, we become our own experimenters, studying that original source to which science owes its beginning, nature, end quote. A month later, Louis Sherman of Oakland, California, detailed his own experiments with growing cabbages with what he called, quote, modernistic treatments alongside those treated with compost. The cabbage grown with chemicals he found became green with lice, while those grown in compost thrived. Comparing the quality of the cabbages, Sherman claimed, quote, we simply couldn't stomach the modernistic cabbages, end quote. These homegrown experience, experiments cataloged over the years and reproduced endlessly in the pages of Rodale's magazine provided the evidence the organic movement built itself on. Gardeners also would use Rodale's magazines to do more than just catalog their backyard experience. They documented their experience with the changing ecology of daily life. They sent in clips from newspapers around the country about pesticide accidents and shared their personal experiences with antihistamines and deodorants and cosmetics and food preservatives and the whole array of synthetic compounds that were entering foods and consumer goods and the broader environment. Beginning in 1954, organic, garden start, start, organic gardening started each issue of, with a column called The Organic World that provided a bulleted list of news items and stories of interest to readers. It was in this space that Rodale and his editors reported on news items they had collected from readers around the country about matters like pesticide poisonings, upcoming fluoridation referendums, 
development and municipal scale composting, and meetings of natural food associations and organic gardening clubs. But the issue that really brought Rodale's, re Rodale's readers out of their backyards in the 1950s was the aerial spraying of public and private lands with pesticides. Agricultural areas had grown accustomed to planes being used to treat fields, but spraying for pests like gypsy moths and fire ants became increasingly common in the late 1950s, often in areas that had once been agricultural and which were rapidly becoming residential as suburbs were being bulldo were bulldozed into the countryside. Like the specter of fallout drifting from atomic blasts, organic gardeners and others would see a plane casting chemicals over the landscape from high above, not as agri agricultural progress and improvement, but as a site that invoked uncertainty and anxiety. Now, an important thing to consider here is this. If you are an organic gardener, choosing not to spray uh, your potato patch or your, your tomatoes or your raspberries or whatever, or avoiding fertilizers in your own garden was, was really up to you. It's an individual choice. Even if the scientists at the local college and your neighbors thought you were silly, you know, unless your compost heap gets really, really smelly, you know, no one's really going to mess with you. Nobody really cares about how you're growing your tomatoes. But when pesticides were applied from the air, they crossed broad swaths of land. They drifted from one field to next, and sometimes from a field to a backyard garden. Organic gardeners who had spent years nourishing their soils with compost and avoiding sprays could find their gardens covered in toxins against their will from the air above. And suddenly it, the issue was no longer about whether compost produces better tomatoes. Suddenly it was about that most sanctified of American rights, the right of private property. And like many battles over property rights, battles over aerial spraying in the late 1950s often started as intensely local issues as gardeners protested the town and county agencies and the farmers who sprayed their land. Turning the information gathering function of Rodale's organic gardening to, the, to, to their own ends, readers pieced together their local battles into a national issue. Readers wrote letters appealing to other readers to help with their campaigns. Leaders of organic clubs updated the editors on the progress of their local fights. When a dozen organic gardeners and conservationists sued the state of New York to halt the spraying of DDT on Long Island in 1957, Rodale's editors kept readers updated on developments and asked them to help fund the litigation. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the magazine produced information and films about spraying for clubs to use in raising awareness about the issue. After years of sending in their gardening tips, Rodale's readers were now sending piles of letters detailing their own local experiences with aerial spraying. Earl Browand of Panama City Florida, writing in three years before Rachel Carson's silent spring, reported that, quote, one noticeable result of the recent spraying for fire ants is the absence of a familiar note from birds of any kind. It's a pathetic situation. At this rate, it's not hard to visualize the day when our grandchildren will, grandchildren will ask, what is a bird and where did it go? Not a pleasant thing to think about, is it? End quote. Readers used the magazine as a tool in their local battles. Mrs. Salome Stark sent a dollar for 10 reprints of Rodale's case against poison spraying, which she said would make, quote, excellent ammunition to add to my protests against the horrible poisoning campaign we are subjected to here in Lakeland, Florida, end quote. Another reader suggested that the reprints should be distributed to women's clubs across the country. Readers routinely sent copies of Organic Gardening's articles to local papers and encouraged other readers to do the same. And what is interesting about this formative political activity of organic gardeners in the pages of Rodale's magazine is that it offers us a place, a, a, a different place to locate the emergence of environmental activism in post-war America. Rather than young radicals or far-sighted ecologists, organic gardeners were pragmatic citizens, many of them older suburbanites who were unhappy with what they saw happening in their backyards and whose political motivations were built on concerns about private property and the destruction of the commons. These gardeners, the venerable, venerable little old ladies in tennis shoes, were not just passive readers of Rodale's gardening advice, but consumers and citizens who embraced organic ideals and Rodale publications as a source of power. <clears throat> now, I hope I've given you a sense 
that Rodale and, and Rodale's readers and organic enthousi enthusiasts of the 1950s and 1960s can be thought of as kind of an unexpected expected network of early environmental activism. But I want to throw a bit of a wrench in the works here by arguing that one of the reasons this network has been overlooked is because it emerges so firmly from the context of commercial culture. Indeed, one of the most unpredictable parts of this story is that the Rodale Press, in addition to introducing and popularizing organic foods and changing how many Americans thought about farming and the environment, also learned how to make healthy profits in the process. And again, the core argument of this book is that the Rodale Press shows us how the marketplace could be a vital, if contested, space for understanding where environmentalism emerged from. And this part of the book unfolds by exploring another Rodale publication, Prevention, and how it created a space for consumers and producers of natural health ideas and products to find one another. Rodale launched Prevention in 1950, and the magazine quickly developed a devoted following. Prevention was very different from the one you might see at the supermarket checkout today. It was basically a digest of natural health ideas, but it was not just ideas that the press packed into Prevention's pages each month, but also a slew of natural health products. We have to remember that in the 1950s and 1960s, there were no organic aisles in the grocery store, and health food stores were pretty few and far between. Rodale's Organic Gardening sold its fair share of rototillers, lawnmowers, and compost activators, but it was Prevention's ads for natural products that ultimately made the company successful. Indeed, well into the 1980s, it was advertising for natural health products, particularly vitamins and food supplements, which, which underwrote all of the company's other activities. As its circulation grew, Prevention became a veritable book of ads for vitamin supplements and all manners of natural health accoutrement. To offer just a glimpse of what this advertising looked like, Flipping through the May 1960 issue, for example, a reader would have encountered offers for products like New Age Bioorganic Products, Evercycle Exercisers, Energol Wheat Germ, supplements with names like Prochemo, Fortisen, Geronat, Ferrovite, and Flavonet. Other products included bulk sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, bone meal, and tablet and flake form, desiccated livers, lecithin, liverol, B12, and fish oil capsules, a book called Facts on Fluoridation, an ad for the Rancho La Puerta Health Resort, and products ranging from juicers, grinding mills, salad makers, and to electric sleep inducers. And this is just one page that you see here uh, in front of you. And these pages go on and on and on throughout every month um, of this publication. Um, and you'll notice here that this is uh, Walnut Acres, the precursor to the, the um, large natural food company brand that still exists, uh, which actually began as a mail order uh, uh, farm in Penns Creek, Pennsylvania. Far from hiding this relationship with advertisers and their products, the Rodale Press celebrated it as a service to their readers who couldn't find the natural products they wanted at a local store. I won't say much more about the relationship between the vitamin industry and the organic movement, but I want to flag this point that the organic movement from the outset was largely underwritten by and embedded within a marketplace of buying and selling natural products. And when concerns about pollution and ecology reached national headlines in the late 1960s and early 1970s, this moment right after the first Earth Day that we often think of as the seminal launching of the environmental movement, a new generation of consumers became interested in natural health and organic gardening. And the Rodale Press had a well-developed system of market research to generate books that targeted environmentally-minded consumers. Rodale books of the 1970s promoted environmental activism, while homesteading titles like Stocking Up, The Rodale Cookbook, and The Venerable Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening became popular by scaling down environmental concerns into easy-to-follow, informative, and enjoyable guides for do-it-yourself success and choosing an organic lifestyle. Behind this part of the Rodale story is not J.I. Rodale, but his son Robert. Robert had worked for the press since dropping out of college at age 19 in 1949, and for Robert, the company was not a hobby, but his life's works. His life's, his life's work. Bob Rodale had been the editor of Organic Gardening and Farming as early as 1954 and took over the press after his father's sudden passing in 1971. And it's really Bob Rodale who was responsible for transforming the press from this curious outpost in rural Pennsylvania into the launching pad for organic research and commerce in the 1970s. 
1973, Bob purchased 300 acres of land to launch what is now the Rodale Institute and supported research in what used to be called regenerative and then alternative and then sustainable agriculture. And now they're going back to regenerative once again. In addition, the company launched a research unit in alternative technology that tested everything from bicycle-powered grain mills to backyard aquaculture and solar power. In an era before any type of USDA support for organic research, the Rodale Research Center produced detailed studies on organic conversion and the economic and ecological benefits for people in nature. Yet the Research Center also doubled as a site for developing materials for Rodale's commercial publications. All of these projects, the test kitchens, the solar food dryers, the aquaculture pens, helped the company test ideas for more magazines, more subscribers, more book club members, and indeed more revenue. Over the course of the 1970s, revenue for the Rodale Press grew tenfold, and many of the profits were cycled back into research and product development. It's kind of hard to see here, but you, it, you, can, you can see there's a small picture right here of uh, two people using a bicycle-powered uh, plow uh, in a field, one of these. Uh, inventions that you have to wonder, wh where, did that, where did that one go over time? Now, please don't, don't think that I'm calling attention to the role of commercial culture and environmentalism because I want to call it hypocritical or something. As I said at the outset, one of the things I find most interesting about the Rodale story is that it gives us a way to look at the role of the marketplace and consumer culture in changing environmental values in the second half of the 20th century. We know a lot about how Sierra Club photography books, the Whole Earth Catalog, and wildlife films reshaped how Americans thought about nature. We also know a lot about the impact of landmark books like Silent Spring, The Population Bomb, Small is Beautiful. But we rarely think about prosaic matters like cookbooks, gardening guides, and popular magazines, and natural product advertising. That is to say, we often think about the history of the environmental movement as it emerged in opposition to consumer culture, rather than how it emerged within consumer culture. And as a way of sort of wrapping up and turning our attention maybe to some things um, of more relationship to those of you associated with the Savannah Institute, um, I don't want to give the impression that there was never anything about trees or orchards or agrofo agroforestry. Uh, certainly, the term agroforestry wouldn't appear for, for many years, but, um, and this is certainly not something that I've dug into a great deal, uh, but the Road Hill story has some important intersections, I think, with the history of agroforestry and perennial farming more generally. Organ organic gardener readers were keenly interested in pr producing fruits and nuts without the application of pesticides and fertilizers. Um, as many of you uh, likely know, fruit production without pesticides uh, was a considerable challenge. Um, and without efforts from agricultural researchers and uh, cooperative extensions and things like that, early organic enthusiasts had to rely on their own experiences and those of others, uh, which was frequently shared through Organic Gardening and Farming magazine. Um, and over the years, the company produced a number of books that guided readers on how to do so. Most common was stuff like this that you see here. Um, articles about the merits of um, including nut trees in the garden, uh, new varieties of nut trees. And you'll see here that it says nut trees for uh, the organic homestead. And, and that was the most frequent way in which um, trees were really discussed was as part of a sort of homesteading plan um, and, and to, to broaden home uh, production beyond the vegetable garden. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that you would really see it in a, as a sort of at a landscape scale, um, but really at the farmstead scale, homestead scale. Um, and Rodale promoted this idea of the organic uh, homestead, and you can see this is in 1957. This is a term that would come up uh, for many years. Uh, basically by drawing from something that looks uh, something very similar to this. This is uh, Ed and Carolyn Robinson's uh, have more plan, uh, which was originally published uh, right after World War II in 1946 and went through many uh, iterations. And these were uh, relatively uh, cheap books. I'm sorry, it, uh, copyright 1944 uh, here in the corner, um, uh, which was promoted as the have more plan for a little land and a lot of living. Um, and you can see here how uh, things like berries, and grapes, and fruit trees, um, and a small orchard are, and are sort of included, um, as well as a, a woodlot, compost, um, are sort of integrated as part of that. 
Um, articles around stuff like this were uh, pretty common fare in organic gardening and farming, um, sometimes with a few more specifics, but again, not really much beyond sort of the homestead scale. And here's another look. Um, and most of this type of advice um, was not really for an ecological pur purpose, but was largely about independence and producing fruits that were part of home production schemes. Uh, later in the 1970s and 1980s, the Rodale Press did publish some titles that drew more direct links between perennial farming methods and the inclusion of trees. In 1978, the company published the, the first English translation of Masanobu Fukuoka's One Straw Revolution, uh, one of the sort of uh, uh, key texts of, of permaculture, uh, perennial agriculture, if you will. And in 1981, published Gene Logsdon's Organic Orcharding. Um, Logsdon is a, is a homesteader and has written many, many titles uh, in this genre, some for the Rodale Press and, and, and other places. Um, and Logsdon writes about integrated uh, uh, pest management as a tool for managing trees and, and farming methods more generally, and certainly argues that trees play a vital role in the ecology of the farm, um, although I'm not sure he u really uses the term agroforestry. At the same time, throughout the 1980s, the Rodale, uh, Robert Rodale supported research on farm conversion and conservation farming methods, both in the United States and abroad uh, throughout the 1980s. Um, let me just state here that there's a lot of work, more work to be done here. Uh, my work largely ends with Robert Rodale's death in 1990. So I'd love to learn more from all of you about what you know about links between the organic movement and agroforestry more generally. Uh, these are just a few examples, but I'm sure that there are many more. So let me just wrap up here um, a bit, and then uh, we'll take some que I'll take some questions. Um, and, when we say, and, and just say that when we look closer at the history of the organic movement and environmentalism through the story of Rodale, not only did organic not mean a fraction of what it has now been loaded down with, it also emerged from different cultural, political, and indeed commercial contexts than we might predict. Moreover, Rodale's story also reminds us of some of the curious paths by which ideas about the environment made their way into both the marketplace and our debates about sustainability, and force us to think critically about whether the marketplace is the best place to arbitrate solutions to our environmental challenges. Uh, so thanks uh, so much to listen to me go on for uh, hopefully around 45 minutes, um, and I'm looking forward to talking uh, and answering some questions. Thank you so much for that illuminating presentation, Dr. Case. I learned a lot, and as you were chatting, why folks are dropping their questions in the chat box, um, one of the things that jumped out at me the most was some of the, the major shared themes between the rise of organic and the rise of agroforestry, um, including uh, a movement based kind of in the same population of older folks that are jumping on the agroforestry bandwagon faster than anyone else, and people that are uh, building the movement through action, through the planting of, of trees and orchards and agroforestry, large spread agroforestry plots, um, as well as trying to change things at the ground level. Interesting. Um, for, it looks like no one's joining us by phone, but if you're joining us by computer, please go ahead and drop any questions you have here in the chat box. <coughs> how, did, how did you first get interested in Rodell and uh, kind of tracing these, uh, these lines of inquiry into the Sure, future? sure, yeah. So, um, I wrote, a, uh, I wrote a master's thesis um, about fluoridation um, and, and arguments over the, the addition of, of fluoride compounds to water in the 1950s and 1960s. And uh, the Rodale Press uh, produced a lot of material um, against fluoride um, for many decades. Um, and I just, I, I sort of just turned up all this stuff and I realized that there was a larger story here about natural health and natural food people, um, and I just sort of kept on digging from there. Um, I wanted to get as far away from fluoride as I could um, once I was done with, with that project, and I, I kind of never went back to it. 
and uh, instead ended up uh, diving fully into into the Rodale story. I should also say um, that I grew up not far uh, from the Rodale uh, Center, the Rodale Institute. Um, I'm from Kutztown, Pennsylvania, which is just down the road. Uh, so it was also uh, a way for me to kind of return back to the area where I grew up and, and work close by for a little while. One of the other things that popped up during your presentation was talking about how organic gardeners would uh, write in letters and send chips of, of what they were doing. And it seems very similar to much of the message boards and listservs mm. that folks in the alternative farming movements um, rely upon because there is not land-grant university research to support much of the work that's being done there, although things are changing for agroforestry. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, but I mean, relative, to, but still relative to the size of the USDA budget, right? It's, you know, it's still very small. But yeah, I mean, I think you're you're liking it to message boards is absolutely correct. Um, you know, in an era before networked communication, um, the only way that you could find a community that you know that you shared interest in, whether it was organic gardening or um, you know, vitamins or concerns about what's going in your water supply was, was oftentimes through uh, a, a magazine of this nature, which was, which was pretty small and pretty niche uh, for, many, for many years. But, yeah, you would see people, you know, treating it very similar as we would to, um, you know, a message board that says, you know, does anybody know anything about this? Here's what I've been doing in my community um, and sharing information, sharing uh, clips, Oftentimes, people uh, who wrote into organic gardening themselves would then get inundated with letters, and and sometimes organic gardening would have to, you know, re, you know, kind of remind people to take it easy on their readers, and and not in a pile on kind of way, but just like you know, dumping all sorts of clips and stuff on, on them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that whenever we see um, communities that don't have um, a kind of defined presence in mass media or um, mainstream science, you know, they tend to find a way, uh, oftentimes through alternative uh, communication channels, to, to, build, to build those communities. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and your research with us tonight. Um, I will be sending out these slides as well as a YouTube recording of this presentation once we get that edited and up. Um, Dr. Case, thank you again so much for sharing, and we appreciate everything you're bringing to Savannah Institute and this movement. Thanks so much, and uh, keep, up the, keep up the good work. Thanks so much. If you have any questions for me, you can always find me at katie at savannahinstitute.org, and we'd love to see you at the perennial farm gathering. Have a wonderful night, everyone, and happy planning for future plantings. <laughs>